Welcome everyone. My name is Dana White and together with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Will Lin, this is the Myth Salon. Today we are blessed to have Laura Lee Scott of the Sophia Center with us. And I just wanna talk a little bit before we begin about vulnerability. I think we're all feeling as the country passes 100,000 people who have died in the coronavirus in the past three months, we're feeling vulnerable. And how do we cope, how do we cope with that? How do, we, how do we process being vulnerable with something that can take us out the moment we leave our home or at least two or three weeks later? So I looked at that and I found this poem by David White. Vulnerability is not a weakness, a passing indisposition, or something that we can arrange to do without. Vulnerability is not a choice. It is the underlying ever-present and abiding undercurrent of our natural state. To run from vulnerability is to run from the essence of our nature. The attempt to be invulnerable is the vain attempt to be something that we are not, and most especially to close off our understanding of the grief of others. More seriously, in refusing our vulnerability, we refuse the help needed at every turn of our existence to immobilize the essential title and conversational foundations of our identity. And so I hope that you will join with me that wherever you are and however you go out into public, the symbol of respecting our vulnerability and respecting the vulnerability of others is the mask. I think the mask is gonna be with us for quite some time. It is, it is part of the new normal. And whether we take it off when we have people over and we socially distance in our backyards, if we walk our animals in the neighborhood, wear the mask. It just says that we are vulnerable. We are part of the same tribe that we are together. So with that, I'd like to begin the Myth Salon today With just a moment of silence, please. One hundred thousand people after the first of the year, more than the wars that we've had in America, more than any singular event. It's truly a tragedy and there is so much more that we could do and ought to do. All right, with that, Will, I'm gonna pass over to you. Welcome my friends. Thank you, Dana. Um, and thank you for that moment of silence, uh, feeling the vulnerability. Uh, I lost a, a family member whose house I grew up in last week to COVID, and the funeral will be tomorrow. Uh, so uh, I hope everybody who's going through something similar, uh, you know, took in that moment of silence. Um, and it's great to be with, with friends right now, for sure. So. Um, you know, I, I want to start just by saying, kind of commenting on what I, what I always like to comment at the start of these. It's so wonderful having Laura Lee here uh, representing the Sophia Center. As we've talked about, it's one of our main goals to expand the network of mythologists. There are lots of pockets and there are lots of places where mythology is very important. And um, it's very important to me and to us to bring those nodes of conversation into conversation with each other. 
Uh, and I feel like that's, that's something that's really excellent that's happening tonight, uh, having Laura Lee here. Uh, I really value what she said. For those of you who were here a little early about the democratization of epistemologies, uh, the desire to hear from people from, from all these different modalities, uh, the, the myth salon is anchored in myth. And so our core modality is myth, but even myth requires a thousand modalities to engage. Uh, so it's incredibly valuable for us to, to be here tonight with Laura Lee. She'll tell you some more about the Sophia Center and, and I'm sure some will come up and those of you who are here early uh, heard about some of the things going on there. And I want to encourage those of you who weren't here early that if you do come, we'll make, uh, you know, on time, we'll make sure that you, uh, you hear about other things going on in the larger mythological community. And we'll keep you updated on, on uh, opportunities, including one you might look for in the chat with, uh, with Dennis coming up. Uh, so let me introduce our panel and then, and then Laura Lee. Uh, first of all, of course, you, you know Dana White, producer and contributing faculty at Pacifica and the co-founder and host of this Myth Salon. Um, we continue to say that I've been, I'm the chair of general education at Studio School, but we have changed our name as of last week to Hushin College. So I'm now the chair of general education at Hushin College. That's a story not worth going into tonight. <laughs> also a co-founder and moderator of this Myth Salon. Uh, Dr. Dennis Slattery is an author, poet, scholar, and faculty member at Pacifica. Dr. Zaman Stanazai is an author, scholar, faculty member, and poet at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Dr. Elizabeth Nelson is an author, scholar, and faculty member at Pacifica and the Sophia Center. Uh, Dr. Voris Nunley is an author, scholar, professor of philosophy at the University of California, Riverside. And Dr. Selena Matthews is an author and clinical depth psychologist. And so now let me uh, introduce our wonderful guest, Laura Lee Scott, who is the founder and director of the Sophia Center for Transformative Learning and former ed executive director of the Assisi Institute, where she designed, developed, and delivered educational courses and conferences focused on a psychoanalytical understanding of creativity, trauma, and identity for professionals from around the world. She's a certified MBTI consultant, archetypal pattern analyst, and sought after public speaker. Uh, Laura Lee has consulted with Fortune 100 companies in developing training programs to catalyze breakthrough creativity and organizationally sustainable transformation. She's been a featured presenter at conferences around the world, including Portugal, Russia, Italy, and Australia. Her graduate studies focused on interdi interdisciplinary links between Jungian psychology, brain science, creative theory, and performance art as activism. Her past artistic work includes a dance theater production focused on the global issue of human trafficking that resulted in the passage of anti-trafficking legislation. And Laura Lee's work around this issue is featured in an academic text published by Rutledge called Grief in the Expressive Arts. And with that, I'd like us all to welcome, welcome uh, Laura Lee Scott. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you tonight. Thank you so much, uh, Dana and Will and all of, all of the panelists uh, this evening. I am thrilled and it is a, is a deep honor to be able to spend this evening with you. Um, I'd, I'd also like to say thank you to uh, Elizabeth, a special shout out, who was the one who connected, I, I believe, Dana and, and Will and I, um, and to uh, someone who is very integral to the Sophia Center, Sheila Wright, who's the Director of Community Engagement, um, who was a part of that initial meeting where I think Dana and Will, Shaler and I got on a Zoom session, and I think we talked about 90 miles an hour for like, you know, an hour um, because it was a real meeting of the minds uh, and not only of the minds, I think a real meeting of soul and vision and mission. And Elizabeth was the one to say, hey, you, you, you kind of need to meet these guys. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and more to come, more collaboration to come, uh, especially in these times. Uh, communities like these are so vital, so needed, so necessary. I know you all realize that, so thank you so much um, for this time. Just by way of introduction, and I, you know, I was so excited. I went back and listened to a lot of the, the previous Miss Salons that I hadn't gotten a chance to be a part of, and I was just so enraptured uh, with so many of the guests that you had on. Um, the way they presented, the material they presented. Um, before I dive into what I'm going to be sharing about tonight, which is the way to our beyond, moving through the darkness with COVID dragons and the dark feminine, before I actually jump into that, just by way of introduction for me, that's not the kind of pedigree read through, and thank you, Will, for that, but um, I've all my life been fascinated with transformation. 
And I think it's only been very recently that I really identified that common thread. My background started in the world of classical dance. I am the second in three generations of classical dancers. Uh, I started in my mom's dance studio. My, da my daughter started in my studio. Um, so there's something about the dance that speaks deeply and I think is in our, our DNA. But with regards to the world of dance and, and also theology and biblical studies, scriptural studies, um, that's my undergrad degree was in the theological studies. You know, the thread, and then from that into the world of Jung and Jungian studies, and the thread in all of those has been uh, my deep fascination with transformation. Even in the world of dance, I remember as a young girl, uh, my mom taking me for my uh, eighth birthday to a place called Jacob's Pillow, which if any of you are dancers, you probably know Jacob's Pillow, just this magical, magical place in the Berkshires where all in the summer, all of the internationally renowned dance companies go to perform. And we, we arrived early at Jacob's Pillow. It, it was a hot, muggy August day in the Berkshires. And my mom took me around to this kind of side building where there was a dance class in progress. And I kind of wriggled my eight-year-old body through the crowd in the doorway and leaned inside the door enough to see in that room. And this was when, you know, there was no air conditioning. So it reeked of, you know, perspiration and, and, and uh, cigarette smoke. And it was full of dancers. And the choreographer was in the front of the class calling out the, the count. And I was completely transfixed in that moment. Uh, it was like the whole entire world just dropped away. And it was one of those moments where you meet destiny and you know it. Even at eight and nine years old, I knew that. And what I was so transfixed with was what was happening in that room. Now, if you ask me this evening, Laura Lee, what was the show that you saw? What did you see on stage with the lights? I couldn't tell you. I have no recollection of that, but I could almost do the steps of the dancers in that room. And so tonight where I want to go with this conversation is leaning into in this time, in this just surreal time that we're all meeting in and we're all trying to navigate our way through, leaning into this world of transformation, not in a romanticized, idealistic way. So um because as you know you know and as dancers know and from the i'm going to be speaking to you from the orientation of of a dancer and of an of an artist in some of this material so with that let me share screen and we will begin okay long long ago before men had mapped the world Ancient cartographers would draw lions and dragons at the edges of their maps and write hic sveint dracones, here be dragons. What is it in the human psyche that compels us to project our worst fears into the terra incognita, the unknown land beyond the edges of the maps? And in exiling our dragons to the margins, do we ensure that we will be possessed by them? Lured by the seductive fascination of mystery and yet immobilized by our own terror of what is yet to be discovered, do we hold ourselves hostage in this liminal space of uncertainty, ambiguity, and indecisive fear? Tonight, I'm going to invite you to sail towards the edges of the map with me to this marginal land of dragons. And I'd like to ask you to consider that perhaps not all dragons exist in order to be killed. However, this invitation comes with a caution. This is a journey that cannot be traversed like those you've so often read about. We cannot board this vessel like Odysseus with his valiant soldiers, armored up and prepared for battle. This is not a vessel of war, and this is not a journey of domination, power, and control. Just days before his death, rabbi, scholar, and activist Abraham Heschel was asked what advice he would give to young people. He said simply, live your life as a work of art. I think this particular moment in history mandates perhaps more than ever before that we find our way towards a true, genuine conjunctio of science and art. 
I believe Jung's psychology in many ways illustrates his own engagement and struggle with this. However, we exist in a culture that has often taught us not to prioritize honoring soul, not to prioritize honoring intuition, not to prioritize honoring the dark feminine, and not to prioritize honoring suffering as a necessary pathway to wholeness. We've too often not been taught to honor the way of the artist. Camus wrote, in times of great suffering, if art insists on being a luxury, it will also be a lie. The only way to board this vessel is with the orientation of the artist. We approach it the way the painter approaches a blank canvas, the way the composer seats themselves at the keyboard, the way the dancer moves out onto the dance floor. We must be, as Martha Graham wrote, doom eager for destiny, committed no matter what the cost. We don't march in rigid lockstep like soldiers going into battle. We must learn to move gracefully, fluidly. We must learn the way the classical dancer learns, to hold the tension in our bodies of pushing down deep to root ourselves in the depths, even while we lift and reach towards the heavens. For it's this orientation alone that allows us to move with the greatest degree of flexibility, fluidity, and grace. In her book, Feeling Beauty, The Neuroscience of Aesthetic Experience, author Gabriel Starr writes this, Neurally speaking, art moves us by harnessing a key system with extraordinary resources, a system that not only helps make us who we are, but also helps us be aware of who we are. Powerful aesthetic experience makes us return to that state of watchful waiting, characteristic of core consciousness. But carrying an awareness of the pleasure of looking at an object and contemplating its worth. Perhaps powerful aesthetic experience unites what we didn't predict with what we were always waiting for. Today, as we find ourselves trying to navigate the disorientation and forced isolation of a global pandemic, this archetypal fear of the unknown has been constellated as we struggle to find our way in uncharted terrain. Apocalyptic language that before COVID rarely made it into our vernacular is now part of our daily Facebook feeds and news headlines. Clinicians and therapists are talking about working with COVID dreams that are full of apocalyptic imagery and symbols. In her book, The Way of Individuation, Yolanda Jacoby writes, as soon as an individual is threatened with the danger of isolation, there is a compensatory increase in the production of collective archetypal symbols. And we of course consciously recognize that COVID is not the apocalypse. But how do we understand this archetypal constellation of apocalyptic fear and fascination? Now, there are leading psychoanalytical theorists who have suggested that it's our unconscious fascination with death that makes the apocalypse so compelling, and that it offers a type of collective escapism from having to own personal responsibility for taking any kind of courageous action in this pandemic. And while I recognize a familiar ring of truth to that explanation, I'd like to suggest that perhaps there is more to this story. The etymology of the word apocalypse comes from two ancient Greek words that when combined mean to uncover or to take away that which is hiding something. Hence the book written by John the Apostle when he was in exile on the island of Patmos, Revelations. COVID is often being referred to as the great revealer. But of course, the question is just exactly what is being revealed and what do I do with what is revealed? The answers to those questions seem to be as varied as the diversity of face masks we're all seeing in our local supermarkets. I think it's important to understand and to recognize that what is revealed is directly related to what we are able to see. In scriptures, there's a phrase that, you, that is often repeated that goes like this, let those who have eyes to see, see. Let those who have ears to hear, hear. This is speaking to an ancient recognition that truth, 
and I feel like I have to use that word in quotes, that truth is often gradually revealed to individuals rather than suddenly grasped by the masses. And transformative truth unfolds over time in direct relation to our own personal evolution and development. And I believe it does not come without some degree of suffering. There is a story that is told, a Baal Shem Tov story that goes like this, that kind of illustrates what, what I'm talking about, about truth being related and what's be revealed being related to what we're able to see. The story goes like this. Once a musician came to town, a musician of great but unknown talent. He stood on a street corner and began to play. Those who stopped to listen could not tear themselves away, and soon a large crowd stood enthralled by the glorious music whose equal they had never heard. Before long, they were moving to its rhythm, and the entire street was transformed into a dancing mass of humanity. Until a deaf man walking by wondered, has the world gone mad? Why are the townspeople jumping up and down, waving their arms and turning in circles in the middle of the street? Hasidim, concluded the Baal Shem Tov, are moved by the melody that issues forth from every creature in God's creation. If this makes them appear mad to those with less sensitive ears, should they therefore cease to dance? I believe we're in these times where it's the it's the artists, it's the creatives who are able to hear the music that perhaps not everyone is able to hear, who are able to see the artistry that perhaps everyone is not able to see, who carry, as Camus was, was referring to in that quote I shared earlier, who carry a significant responsibility to illustrate, to make art, to share it. Picasso said this, we all know that art is not truth. Art is a lie that makes us realize the truth, at least the truth that is given to us to understand. So here you hear him echoing the same idea, that truth is revelatory over time, and it's dependent and connected to our own commitment, I believe, to journey to the depth, which is part of where we're going to go this evening. There was a time in the art world, I'm sure many of you know this, referring to modernism and, and more particularly postmodernism, when beauty was literally outlawed in the art world. Um, in a lecture he gave at the Museum of Mo Modern Art, Howard Gardner, a uh, psychologist and uh, research professor of cognition and education at Harvard said this. He said that there was actually a period of time in the world of high art where beauty was referred to literally as the B word. Um, art that had the faintest smell of beauty as it had always been understood was banned entrance to any of the museums or art galleries. The artist Paige Bradley, who's the sculptor of this statue, that uh, this, the uh, sculptor of this sculpture I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, had a unique story and she, she writes of how this was created. These are her words. She says, Speaking of that time that uh, Howard Gardner was talking about, the few of us that were left had no place to exhibit and our voice was not being heard. Many figurative sculptors started teaching as that was all they could do. If I wanted to stay in the fine art field, I knew I had to join my contemporaries and make quote, contemporary art. I knew that it was time to let go of all the finely tuned skills I had acquired over the years and just trust in the process of making art. The art world was telling me I had to break down my foundation, let my walls crumble, expose myself completely, and from there I will find the true essence of what I needed to say. And I'm sure many of you know this story. She literally took this figure and smashed it into pieces on the floor, and then began the process of reconstructing it and illuminating it from within. But I, I wanna emphasize that statement that she says about breaking down my foundation, letting my walls crumble, exposing myself completely. This is, the, this is where the courage of the artist comes into play. And I also believe it is a part of the process of individuation, um, and in particular, the feminine heroine's journey um, that we're going to talk about a little bit more this evening. And I believe it is a necessary part of the process for the times that we are navigating now. Today, it's not beauty 
that is being deconstructed. But it is paradigmatic models of power, leadership, and socioeconomic inequality that have historically been accepted as normal that are being revealed to expose deep systemic injustice. And so the question remains, if, this, if these cultural structures are to be toppled, are we going to be able to dig down to the meta narratives that form the foundations that support them? This is the time for artists. Artists, generally speaking, and I realize I'm generalizing here, um, please forgive me, but artists, generally speaking, tend to be comfortable with disruption and disorder. They understand the necessity of chaos as part of the initial conditions for creative emergence. And in this season of COVID, there's an almost panicked compulsion to try to make meaning of chaos, to, to um, jettison the, the tension of the uncertainty of the not knowing. Um, we, we all are tuning in, myself included, from one Zoom session to another, listening from one expert to another, you know, walking our dogs and social distancing, yelling to our neighbors, what are we doing? We're, we're trying to make meaning, we're trying to make sense, we're trying to construct some certainty to help orient ourselves and find our footing, even as the tectonic plates are shifting beneath us. And there's lots of conversations that have been happening about emerging into the quote, new normal. Um, you know, it comes through almost as a type of seize the day philosophy that seems to suggest we can maximize the disruptive dynamics of COVID in order to fast forward everything from a liberal political agenda to a quantum leap forward in consciousness. But is this a realistic expectation? I think we have to be careful of a premature rush to make order of chaos. I think we have to hold the tension of disruption. We have to allow time for deconstruction, not only in the outer world around us, but in our own inner worlds as we are literally locked in with this archetypal constellation that Jacoby was writing about. Um, to be able to sustain that tension of the chaos, of the not knowing, um, of the deconstruction of identities that perhaps we have, that have worked for us, that may no longer work for us. And we also need to be considering what might be required of us in this process. What are the necessary sacrifices we will collectively and individually be asked to make? Every artist knows that art comes at a price. To call yourself an artist, um, you know, it, there's something to calling yourself an, an artist. One picture does not an artist make. One dance does not an artist make. You know, to make a classically trained ballet dancer, it takes 10 years, 10 years to make a, a classically trained ballet dancer. This, this is a process that takes time. It was uh, Eric Neumann, who wrote this, when the archetype striving to be born into the light of day takes shape in the artist, he will be as far from the men around him as he will be close to their destiny. One of my very favorite quotes from Neumann in Art and the Creative Unconscious, when the archetypes striving to be born into the light of day take shape in the artist, he will be as far from the men around him as he will be close to their destiny. And I know many of you know what you're seeing on the screen in front of you, Van Gogh. That painting was the first painting he ever did. And he later wrote that of all his paintings, this one remained his favorite. It's called The Potato Eaters. And it's of the, the working folk and the working class. Um, and, and I know most of you, you know, probably know the story of Van Gogh, you know, that he, he died never knowing and never realizing and never getting the recognition. But for the, for the artist, it's not about the recognition or the fame or the, or the money. It's about the, it's the process. It's the process. So I want to, I want to share part of a poem with you. And then we're going to go into um, the second part of what I'd like to share with you this evening. This is the the, a poem by D.H. Lawrence, and I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to confess to you this evening. So, you know, I titled my presentation, you know, um, uh, "The Way to Our Beyond: Moving Through the Darkness," 
And I had already picked this poem. It didn't dawn on me until well after, um, I think it was yesterday, that, that the title of this poem is The Song of a Man Who Has Come Through. I never made the connection between the title of the poem and the title of my presentation. Um, but let me just read it to you, um, and then we'll go from there. It says this, not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me. A fine wind is blowing through the new direction of time. If only I let it bear me, carry me. If only it carry me. If only I am sensitive, subtle, oh delicate, a winged gift. If only, most lovely of all, I yield myself and am borrowed by the fine, fine wind that takes its course through the chaos like a fine, exquisite chisel. If only I am keen like the sheer tip of a wedge driven by invisible blows, the rock will split. We shall at the wonder. We shall find the Hesperides. Oh, for the wonder that bubbles into my soul, I would be a good fountain, a good wellhead, would blur no whisper, spoil no, no expression. What is the knocking? What is the knocking at the door in the night? It is somebody wants to do us harm. No, no, it is the three strange angels. Admit them, admit them. And it's that last stanza that I want to go into this next section. Uh, looking at this evening. What is the knocking at the door in the night? It is somebody wants to do us harm. No, it is the three strange angels. Admit them, admit them. What I'd like you to consider this evening is that perhaps some of the dragons we've exiled to the margins, uh, rather than dragons that need to be killed, may just be the three strange angels. D.H. Lawrence is urging us to admit into our lives. And so we're going to go into the next part of this uh, this evening, talking about, um, we'll, we'll talk about it, I'm just watching the clock in terms of time, but I, wanted, I want to talk about three different uh, dynamics that I think in this time of COVID, from a creative artistic perspective, we can perhaps look at. And so the first dragon, and whether we see them as a dragon or an angel, I think depends upon each of us. You know, the, the symbology of an angel is not only a, a divine messenger, but, but angels serve to give us an orientation to new terrain. Angels serve, when you, when you read them in a lot of these sacred wisdom traditions, what they're doing is they're giving an orientation to the terrain that has yet to be traveled. And in many ways, artists do the same thing. There is a prophetic element to art that Eric Neumann writes um, beautifully about. There is that sense in which artists are the, we can use this term, you know, the early adapters to what is in the collective unconscious. They're channeling something and they're tapping into something and they're able to illustrate it long before it emerges into the collective consciousness. So the first angel I would like us to consider allowing in and you can either refer to this as the dragon of suffering or the angel of healing regression. The dragon of suffering or the angel of healing regression. And I'm just put, putting a quote up here. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this quote that really speaks to some of the work Jung did and it speaks to the archetypal hero's journey. But what I'm suggesting this evening is that in these times in particular and in where we're headed, um, as we move through COVID, it's going to necessitate a mandate that each of us, women and men, become familiar uh, travelers with the heroine's journey. So perhaps our dragons do not need to be slayed, perhaps. In fact, they need to be nurtured. So as we're looking at this angel of healing regression, you know, I often want to think I see the world through the wholeness of myself, but often I see the world through the most unacknowledged, broken places within me. And yet it is through my brokenness that the numinous reveals an illuminated reality that I would otherwise have been blind to. Marion Woodman writes it this way, at the very point of vulnerability is where the surrender takes place. That is where the God enters the God comes through 
the wound. And Dana, I had no idea you were going to be reading a poem about exactly this at the start of this evening's session. Re recognizing that we see the world often through our most unacknowledged broken places helps me to give compassion and patience to myself, but also it helps me to be compassionate and patient with those that I encounter in this journey. In the Red Book, Young writes about the way to your beyond, where he offers a glimpse at the prima materia of his own inner wrestlings as he worked with his creative unconscious during a season of personal upheaval and traumatic transition. In talking about that, he, he wrote this comment, the soul demands your folly, not your wisdom. You know, he, he, he references this over and over again in the, in the Red Book, and he also references it in the, in the collected works. There's a place in the Red Book where he makes this comment, have you counted the murderers among the scholars? And what I think he's pointing to is he's saying, in this journey, we cannot go there with our intellectual theorizing. We go there, and I'll, I'm going to read just this part to you from the Red Book relative to the way to your beyond. He says this, but here you may not stop. Do not place your disgust between your here and now and your beyond. The way to your beyond leads through hell, and in fact, through your own holy particular hell. Your hell is made up of all the things that you always ejected from your sanctuary with a curse and a kick of the foot. When you step into your own hell, never think that you come like one surrendering in beauty or as a proud pariah, but you come like a stupid and curious fool and gaze in wonder at the scraps that have fallen from your table. I know this isn't necessarily feel good reading for us this evening, but I do think that this is an archetypal part of this process of that journey of descent of the heroine's journey and also of the artist and the creative. There is that engagement that calls us to the depths where we wrestle and where, where we are broken and where we recognize that it's not about our egoic ability to create something, but that there is um, a, a necessary breaking open in order to allow something greater uh, to come through. This is where you know, the dragon is not killed. Perhaps the dragon is seen. Um, met with. And in the process, we leave changed. I think of Christ going to going into hell, taking back the keys. Um, he didn't, he didn't kill the devil. We think of Anana. Um, there is a, there's an archetypal journey and pattern here. This is the archetypal journey into the deep woods of fairy tales and legends. Dante said it this way, in the middle of the journey of our life, I found myself within a dark woods where the straight way was lost. This is where we sustain that terror of being lost, that tension of not knowing who we are, where we meet the process of the butterfly that we all like to talk about, you know, so much and think about often, but, but the butterfly, the caterpillar literally, before it becomes a butterfly, literally digests itself. When it wraps itself in that chrysalis, it turns itself into nothing but a mess of goo until the only thing that remains in that gooey mess is what are called imaginal cells. I love that. Imaginal cells. And so that digested caterpillar literally reimagines itself into existence as a butterfly. How, how similar to what is often asked of us. See, apocalypse is not about simply the finality of death and destruction. Apocalypse, as you read it in the book of Revelations, is really about the emergence of the new. It is about a purposive suffering, a purposive death that makes room for a new heaven and a new earth. And I think, you know, speaking of fairy tales, the picture that you're looking at, if there is such a thing as a fairy tale for our time and for, you know, this moment, and there's more than one, but I would suggest the fairy tale of the handless maiden and i don't have time this evening to go into I'm, I'm working through this fairy tale with a group at the sophia center right now um this is an amazing tale for for so many many 
reasons. Um, and if we have time, maybe I can get back to it or take questions, but I encourage you to read it um, because there are so many things in this tale that are so relevant for women and men uh, in the times that we are in. Now I wanna take us, well, let me just say this because this image is here for that reason. You know, one of the pieces in that fairy tale is about halfway into the tale, she marries the king and he makes silver hands for the heroine in this story. Um, and they're good enough hands. They're not her own hands, but they're good enough hands. Um, and typically that might be the end of a fairy tale, but with this tale in particular, which although it was given to us by the uh, Grimm brothers, it was actually written by a woman um, and, and told originally by a woman, but those silver hands were not, were not enough. And she journeys then into the very deep woods and it is there seven years in order for her own hands to grow back. So again, I'm going back to that idea of transformation that happens neither quickly nor easily. The second dragon or angel, depending on your perspective this evening, is the dragon of the dark feminine or the angel of the transformative feminine. The dragon of the dark feminine or the angel of the transformative fem feminine. If anyone's read any of Linda Leonard's books, she talks about the transformative feminine. Um, I think Tony Wolf may mention the transformative feminine. You know, we've, we've heard the stories and we've read the stories of Medusa the monster and Salome the sexualized assassin and Philomela and Procne as the dangerous sisters, and Demeter as the devouring mother. But I would suggest that there is another side to those stories, where Medusa is a beautiful young girl who's raped, where Salome is in fact, when if you do the research and, and, and go back to, she was not a sexualized assassin. She was an 11 year old little girl dancing a children's dance that was part of children's games at the at the direction of her mother. Philomela and Procne, yeah, they wreaked a horrible revenge, but we don't hear about Terius who who raped Philomela and cut out her tongue. And Demeter not as the devouring mother, but but Demeter who went on her own individuation journey, which is something that we see often in working with women that her her daughter's distress um, set her on her own individuation journey that necessitated her coming out of the uh, disembodied and, and disidentification of her grief in order to own her authentic powers and step into those in order to be reunited uh, with her daughter. See, I think part of this new world, if there's going to be a new world, the emergence of this new world is going to mean learning and being able to dance back and forth with these stories, learning and being able to look at them from masculine and feminine perspectives, not, and I don't, I'm not using those terms in a gendered way, but understanding that those are archetypal motifs that exist and are constellated in our psyches, but having the ability to see both um, and, and to be able to understand the perspective of the other. We, we are living in a time where the psychologies, and this is changing, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, but historically, uh, you know, often psychologies have placed almost the full burden for the psychological health of humanity on the shoulders of women, while at the same time denying them what is essential for their own psychological wholeness the acceptance and affirmation of themselves as whole and complete individuals. See, this is not about simply, it's not a political movement that's necessary and it's vital, but this goes much, much deeper than that. As Ursula Le Guin writes, we have to rewrite the world. We have to be able, as men and women, to come together, to join forces, to be able to move in this fluid dance, to hold the tension like, uh, you know, in order, in order to dance tango, I don't know if we have any tango dancers on with us this evening, but in order to dance tango, it's a, it's a man and a woman um, together, 
But one of the things that is so critical in being able to dance tango is that each partner has to hold the tension of the space between in order for them to dance as one. And it's a beautiful illustration, I think, for, for how we need to continue to learn and to grow, to move and to dance with, with each other. Dancing and moving together, but holding the tension of the space between. I'm getting a little behind on my slides, but these are, these are images of, uh, believe it or not, of Salome, who was, not in fact, an 11-year-old little girl. And I want to go to the last angel or dragon, depending on your perspective. That, and I would suggest this is a, a dragon or an angel that perhaps we need to learn to dance with. And that is honoring Sophia. Honoring what I believe is an emerging Sophia consciousness and and You know, we don't have time to go into all of what that Sophia consciousness or even a piece of what that is But but we can I think summarize it by saying it is a consciousness that is rooted in an ethic of compassion and wisdom Consciousness that is rooted in an ethic of compassion and wisdom when I think of the the political world as we see it today, we're seeing more and more examples of an emerging Sophia consciousness, even in politics. Um, Jacinda Ardern, when she when she stood in front of you know the television cameras and was speaking uh, to her countrymen about COVID and the lockdown, and took time in that same political grave moment to say to the children who might be watching, and don't worry, I want you to know that, because it was right around Easter time, the Easter Bunny is an essential employee. That, that shattered every political paradigm of, of leadership we've known, and it, it really, I believe, was an indication of an emerging Sophia consciousness that is redefining what power has to look like and sound like and is opening it up and it's not just for women i think we've seen it emerging through some of the male leaders uh, you know possibly at times with trudeau uh, and there there are many others but i think i think this is asking us to stay rooted in that that an ethic of love and compassion even in the midst of the toxicity even in the midst of the politics i like what Camus says here, and this is from his book, The Plague, which if you, you haven't read that, this would be, it's really interesting to read that book right now in this moment. He says this, all I, may, all I maintain is that on this earth, there are pestilences and there are victims, and it's up to us as far as possible not to join forces with the pestilences. I decided to take in every predicament the victim side so as to reduce the damage done. Eight years ago, I read a story in the New York Times, a column by Nick Kristoff about a little girl, a nine-year-old girl who was sold to a brothel in India by her uncle and, and was held there and, and used and, and had a son and a daughter of her own while in the brothel. And it wasn't until uh, the brothel owners were threatening to put her then 11 year old daughter to work that she found the wherewithal to fight for her daughter not unlike in the story one of the versions a russian version of the handless maiden when she's in the deep dark woods the russian version of that story says that the handless maiden her child falls into the water and she asks for help and the angel says to her reach in your own hands and pull the child out and it's at that moment that her real hands grow back this is something i've seen often in a lot of the work that i've done with women is is that what they're not able to do for themselves they will do for their own children and in saving their child much like demeter um, it it is then releases them for their own individuation and heals them and eight years ago i did I read this story and I was horrified and I was um, consumed with it and I started researching and I could not believe what I was reading relative to the sex trafficking industry that I was so incredibly naive to in my middle class world. And I was having nightmares and I thought I have to do something, I have to do something and I felt completely powerless. Um, this is a $32 billion a year in industry. 
Um, it makes more money than Google, Nike, and Starbucks annually combined. And I thought, what can I do? There's nothing that I can do. And, you know, voice kept saying, you can make a dance. And, I, you know, that, that inner critic was like, what good is a dance going to do? What, what, why bother? Um, but eventually, because I had no other choice, I needed to creatively work with it. And that's what we do as artists, as creatives. We take our pain, we take our brokenness, we take, and we, we go into the depths and, and we begin to make something. And I made a dance. And nine months later, it was, it told that, that nine-year-old girl's story. And nine months later, it was on stage at Russell Sage College. And nine months after that, it was written up. The, the actual dance production is literally mentioned and named in the anti-trafficking legislation in the city of Troy. Had I said no, had I ignored that voice about do the one thing you can do, you can make a dance, none of that would have happened. These are the times, regardless of, I believe, how powerless or overwhelmed we may be feeling, that if we can go to the depths and if we can have the courage to break open to the grief and to the suffering and to hold the tension and to be still, at the still point, there the dance is, that in those moments, something greater, the numinous, is going to come, is going to come through. In his book, and this is in conclusion this evening, in his book, The Plague, Camus writes this, what's true of all the evils of the world is true of plague as well. It helps men to rise above themselves. Now, I don't know if I agree with Camus on this one. Does a plague help men to rise above themselves? Will COVID help humanity to rise above themselves? I, I kind of align with Marian Woodman when she writes, it's easier to try to be better than you are than to be who you are. And I think that may be part of the challenge for each of us to dare to have the courage to be vulnerable enough to be most authentically who we are. So perhaps this pandemic offers the opportunity for each of us to sit with a deeper revelation of ourselves and to choose to follow the call of psyche and soul to be truer to who we authentically are and to dare to set sail for the margins of the maps where perhaps our exiled dragons are waiting, are waiting for us to listen to them, to dance with them, perchance to love them. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Laura Lee. That was incredible and wonderful. And, and I look forward to us getting into it some more. Um, you know, I, it, I, I, re I remember, um, I won't name a name, but some of you will have heard this story from a faculty member at Pacifica. It talks about a time that she was involved in uh, uh, trans work. Uh, uh, and what had happened is she actually felt herself being taken over. And in that moment, she realized her own religion because in that moment, she called for the big guy, as she put it. She called for God. It's like, what's your religion? Well, in that moment, I knew it because in that moment, I was freaking out and I just called for the big guy. And, I, and for me, the, the big guy is love. You know, I'm lost, I'm confused, the worst thing's going on, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to respond. That's the biggest gun I know is love, you know? And so thank you. Thank you in a major way for encouraging Sophia consciousness, uh, compassion and wisdom and love. Um, normally, uh, normally I, I ask a question and that kind of opens into the panelists, but since, uh, you and Elizabeth have a, have a history and working relationship, I thought, you know, better to just invite Elizabeth to jump in if, 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 as long as I'm not putting you on the spot, Elizabeth, is that okay? Uh, yeah, you are. And that's okay. <laughs> uh, it's just fine. Laurely magnificent presentation and beautiful images that accompany it. Um, I know you and I have had some long conversations about the role of hope and the difference between hope and faith uh, at a time like this. Um, and I'm very curious to hear your, your, your thoughts now, because that, that conversation started several weeks ago. I'm curious to hear your thoughts now about um, hope, faith, and uh, the point that you made, which I think is extremely important, which is, is not to, to bypass this opportunity of, of going down, 
into the darkness or out to the beyond where the dragons are. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth, for that little question. So <laughs> I'm glad I, you, it's nine o'clock my time, right? I did have coffee. I did drink a cup of coffee before I got on this evening. So, all right. So hope, faith, and going to the depths. Well, hmm. hope exists only in the depths. Hope exists only in the depths. Um, and and it's not, I don't see it as a, a hope that is a wishful thinking in any way, shape, or form. In fact, I'm going to borrow from my friend Andrew Samuels, who says, hope in mandates an embrace of risk. It mandates an embrace of risk. Hope runs to the danger. Hope sets sail for the margins of the maps. If hope wasn't there, we would never leave the harbor. So, so hope in that sense is what is what is necessary to keep us from be, from staying imprisoned and frozen and immobilized uh, in the depths. It's what it's what calls us on faith. Uh, I think hope and faith work hand in hand for me. Anyway, that's you know maybe that's a more a more personal piece of it. You know, faith is. You know, think of the the scripture. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Faith fills in the lines of hope. You know, hope outlines the contours. Faith fills it in. Um, faith is substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This is the world of the artist as well as the mystic, right? It's the artist is the, is, is the one who is seeing and hearing what is not seen and not heard by the collective. And the artist is the one who then has to journey to the depths and labor, you know, and labor, literally give birth to what, what wants to come through. And, and perhaps as Neumann was writing and as Van Gogh experienced, live with the sense of exile even after having done that, right? But it's the faith and the hope that keeps the artist going back into the studio, going back to the easel, going back to the computer to write the next chapter. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And of course, Prometheus, uh, one of the representations of hope, also one of the person, one of the representations of, of artists and craftspeople as well. Mm -hmm. And rebellion. And rebellion. And I would add, I let's just bring up Pandora, okay? Because you know, one of the pieces I forgot, and I I meant to close with a quote from Rick Tarnas's book. You know. Uh, you know, the history of the Western mind. I mean, you know, he's got this incredible quote at the end of that book about the feminine, you know, about the conjunctio of the masculine and, and the feminine coming together, right? He wrote that 30 years ago. He wrote that 30 years ago. We still have such a long way to go. And I think, you know, the question as the, you know, the greats discussed it with Pandora is Pandora is still, the feminine is holding hope. The feminine is holding hope. And when I say feminine, I'm not talking, you know, I, I know this group understand, I'm not talking women per se, I'm talking about those qualities that have been exiled, the transformative feminine that we have transmogrified because in a patriarchal culture, we're not comfortable with them. And it's not just that we're not comfortable with them. There was, there's a season and time, evolu you know, you, consciousness doesn't change in a matter of years. It takes millennia for consciousness to change. And we're just living in this particular snapshot of history where we're kind of in this, you know, muck and mire of this tra incredible transition. Yeah. You know, that quote is such an incredible quote. And, and um, I, I shared, I think, with most of this audience and group that uh, I taught that book as, a, as the uh, core text for philosophy class I taught for, for artists, senior artists, uh, college seniors. And uh, that's where we ended the class. And COVID had broken out by the time we were reading that quote. And it was pretty incredible. And, and I wrote to Dr. Tarnas, who was going to come in and actually Skype in with our class. It was going to be a big surprise. And then we like canceled the classes, you know, or changed things. And, uh, but I wrote to him and I, I said, you know, do you think that we could be uh, in an inflection point for that right now? Could this be one of the inflection points 
and I won't put words in his mouth. We've agreed to find a chance to talk about that. Uh, but but it's a question that, that I think is worth asking. Could, could this be one of those great inflection points uh, for the momentum and the direction we've been going? Yeah, and I, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a great question. I mean, he and I had a whole conversation about it in the, in one of the Sophia talks. But I think what, what, what we have to sit with, and this goes back to, I think, what Elizabeth was emphasizing too, is that when it comes to collective consciousness, I don't think there's any such thing as a tipping point. We're not, mm -hmm. we're not going to just walk out our doors 18 months from now when we have a COVID vaccine into a brand new world. It doesn't happen that quickly. It happens slowly and painstakingly, and it happens to the degree that each of us, I think, are able to face the dragons we least want to see. You know, that's the, that's the hard part. You have I, that great I would agree with you on that one, Laura Lee, and I think one of the things that is causing an uptick of anxiety about this, uh, this opening up process is I think there is some concern about, obviously, our, our physical safety, but I think there's a deeper concern that is not being spoken, which is that we're missing an opportunity. Mm -hmm. We're missing mm -hmm. a chance to get to know the dragon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, look, this is, this is hard stuff. And I, you know, I know many of you, you know, I have to be on social media, like we all have to be, unfortunately, or fortunately. And, you know, there was a lot of talk out there at first, we all saw it, right, about, you know, all the, all the things you could do during lockdown, right, all the self-improvement projects. And then you saw like this pushback on social media where people were kind of going, yeah, hang you. I'm, I'm going to stay in my picture. You know, you saw, you saw the pushback to that. Like, I'm just, we, we all have been riding this wave of trauma of this, right? So, so I think what's important is we can't egoically say, I'm going to go to the depths. It's locked down and I need to, right? This is about developing, a, I think, a discernment to be able to listen to the still small voice with inside ourselves to shut off, you know, and listen. To, and, you know, Jacoby said individuation is learning to follow the self, capital S, in its dance. It is not a linear process. It's not step one, step two. Now that, you know, I know we like the nice, neat hero's journeys, but life just doesn't work that way. Sometimes it's a cha-cha. We take one step forward and two steps back, and oh, here I am again, right? It's a circle dance. I'm back at the same place I started, right? So I, I think it's learning how to listen to that voice and follow it in its dance. And yes, I, I agree with you. I think that, that this is a season where, where many of us, and artists in particular, creatives in particular, intuitives in particular, are being called to the depths. Yeah, yeah. And thank you, Elizabeth, because you were the one who challenged me when I was like, hip, hip, hooray, let's just encourage the masses. And Elizabeth was like, Laura Lee, I can't be a part of that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, what? But, but you know what that did? I mean, you know what that did was that, you know, it pulled me up short because uh, obviously, clearly, Elizabeth's one of the faculty at Sophia Center and, and senior faculty. I mean, you know, pulled me up short and it made me stop short and go, okay, I need to really stop and listen and, and sit with this. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I saw Dennis uh, maybe had something for us. Laura Lee, thank you. That was just magnificent. I have three pages of notes in front of me. And I'll quote you anything that I use <clears throat> and give you full credit. Thank you. You know, here are a few of the words <clears throat> that I wrote down that really grabbed hold of me. Disruption. Interruption. Uh, creating gaps, exaggeration. One of my favorite writers is the Southern fiction writer Flannery O'Connor, mm -hmm. who died at the age of 39 from lupus. But she wrote, when, the, when I can keep the wolf on the other side of the door, I'm at my writing desk at 7 a.m. every morning. But something else she said that really... Um, uh, italicizes a good part of your talk. She said, you know, the fiction writer has to write 
in letters this tall. Here's A, here's B, here's C, because they understand that they are writing for a reader who is almost completely blind <clears throat> or has real difficulty seeing anything. Once that reader begins to catch on to the imagination of the writer, then the fiction writer can start writing in smaller letters. And I, I love that image of how exaggeration is absolutely necessary uh, from her point of view, but I, but I heard it uh, running uh, throughout your talk, um, in order to make what's invisible visible. You just can't do it on ordinary, um, on ordinary terms or with ordinary language or with ordinary images. I mean, the images you showed us were just phenomenal. So I'm thinking, oh, and then the other word that also uh, laced through your talk is the sense of paradox itself and not fearing it, but embracing it as maybe this is the tension that's ongoing that uh, you were pointing us to uh, on several occasions. So I'm thinking about the COVID virus as those big letters, big block letters that O'Connor said the fiction writer has to use because the audience is practically blind. And so they need those, the letters of that size. So I'm thinking about the virus as an exaggeration uh, and as revelation. Um, there's a part of me, and I could never prove it uh, if I spent the rest of my life trying to, um, that this virus has its own intelligence in ways that I don't understand, but I, I sense that it's there, that there is an intellect or there's a, there's a form to it. So those are some thoughts that were um, stimulated from uh, your talk. And I wonder if you could just say a, a few words either on paradox or on um, maybe saying a little bit more about exaggeration. Well, thank you, Dennis. And, and you know, exaggeration, I don't even think I used that word. So I'm, like, I'm fascinated with where you're going and where it's going, going with you. I mean, I think, I think that anytime we express creatively and authentically, and as artists, we have the courage to break open in order to do that, uh, what comes forth from that will be larger than life, but it will be authentic. Do you know what I'm saying? So I, I have a little bit of discomfort with the word exaggeration because for me, when, when I walk into a dance studio, what I'm challenged with is I'm challenged to go to the deepest, scariest part of myself in order to make a dance. I'm not thinking, how do I make this bigger than it is? I'm not thinking, how do I make it louder? How do I make it more sensational? All I'm thinking in that moment is, what is the realest, truest, scariest, deepest part of me? And how am I going to put that out there relative to this? And when that happens, we all recognize it, right? We recognize yep. that voice speaks louder than life. That's, you know, what was it that Young said? Um, we speak with a thousand voices, right? We speak with a thousand voices when we do that. So I don't think it's about imposing exaggeration. I no. think it's about going to the depths and having the courage to, to break open. So that's, that's what I would say to exaggeration. I, I think in terms of the paradox and tension, yeah, that's, that's a key, I think a key piece of this. You know, as a, as a one of the hardest things to teach are any of you classically trained ballet dancers on this panel? Elizabeth, you are, right? You've done it. Okay. Come on, Well, you you get your dancing shoes on. Okay, so no, I'm surrounded by them, but I uh, haven't picked up enough yet. <laughs> but I think, you know, one of the most difficult things and one of the most essential things to teach in classical ballet is the orientation of the dancer. Right? 
And it's one of the most essential things when we talk about, I think I'm, I'm trying to, to step away from a change in consciousness because I think it's, it's a, it can be deceiving to an orientation. You know, we're being asked to have a different psychological orientation and we're all trying to figure out what that is moving forward. And in a classically trained dancer, you have to be able to teach someone how to both push down into the ground at the same time that they're lifting up, you know, without doing this, without. And the reason for that orientation in the dancer is that's the only orientation that will allow a ballet dancer to do those unbelievable moves that defy what the body's anatomically able to do. The only way you can get that degree of movement and flexibility is to be able to hold tension in your core. And I think that that is such a beautiful metaphor for what we're being asked to do right now, right? For, for men and women to hold that tension, for men to come on board to say, hey, I, there's something here for me in the heroine's journey. For women to say there's something here for me in the heroes. For all of us to be able to fluidly move back and forth in those journeys, depending on our own personal circumstances and life situations is critical. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Laura Lee. And I see Thank Selena you, has Lee. Yep. And I see Selena has her mute off. Hopefully she has a question yeah. that's not for us. Yeah, I do. Um, great, incredible, Laura Lee. Just uh, such a beautiful, heartfelt, sensitive, authentic presentation. And I really appreciated that. Um, you were talking about reimagining. Uh, I mean, I, I work with clients, so they're all cocooning and they all need to reimagine themselves. And I also, as a therapist, am having to reimagine the way I'm working right now. Like everything is changing and I'm having to go and I actually have to go back to Yalom's Existential Psychotherapy, a basic book to deal with some of the philosophical issues of death, meaningless, uh, you know, isolation. Uh, it's the philosophy that is helping to grow them in the cocoon because I have so many. I see 30 people a week. So I have so many cocooning in, in different ways. But I have to be different because the ways that I used to work are no longer working and I'm needing to change. So um, it, it's kind of like, I feel like I'm in an incredible process as well. I mean, professionally, personally, um, at, you know, as, as, a, as someone who helps other people. Uh, so it's, it's quite incredible. Uh, so not only am I dealing with their dragons, I'm dealing with my own dragons simultaneously. And I, it feels like almost like a magician who's uh, having all these things that they're throwing up and having to catch. It's quite an extraordinary time. Mm. Yeah. I guess the question I have for you is imagination. You're an artist. Um, where do you see imagination and how do you see that really um, taking a person to the next step? Well, I, you know, and I think, you know, respecting, you know, the work that you do, Selena, with these clients and so many, I'm sure, of those who are on tonight are doing, I think I would, I would start with this, that um, before we can reimagine ourselves, we have to really be sure that we have let go of and died to what needs to die that we have, we have lived into a purposive dying. Because if you try to reimagine yourselves, and I see people doing this all the time, you're, we're trying to reimagine ourselves, but we haven't allowed what needs to die. A seed has to fall into the ground and die in order for what, in, in order for it to be sustainable. Otherwise you're building on a faulty foundation and it's not going to be sustainable. It's going to implode and it's going to, so the hard part, for, you know, I think as a therapist, you know, uh, is sitting with and holding the tension and sitting with the creative suffering that has to happen for that purposive dying to happen. And then having the discernment 
and listening to the creative unconscious of the, of the clients that you're working with. The creative unconscious will tell you, you know, if we learn to just speak that, that language, the creative unconscious maps it out for us. It really does. Um, so I think listening to that, then you can begin to work with them based on what is coming through the client's creative unconscious, not an egoic imposition of let's try to create something. Thank you. Voris, uh, I see you're with us. Do you have some thoughts and questions to bring in? Uh, thanks, Will, for asking. Um, absolutely superb. Uh, I don't even want to call it a presentation. It was an experience. I very, very much appreciate it. Thank you, Voris. And what I'm very, very hyped about is the fact that you're taking uh, the dark feminine seriously. So could you, you just brought up this notion of dying. So could you talk more about the, uh, the dark feminine and this kind of metaphorical dying? And it's so pertinent because it makes me think of Toni Morrison and one of her books called The Song of Solomon. Mm -hmm. The main character is a black male and his name is Milk Man because he is so out of touch with the feminine. And who is the only person that can save him? It is a androgynous woman born without a navel, and her name is Pilot. And Pilot is ingenious because Pilot, right, it sounds the same, but it has two different meanings. Pilot, P I L O T, mm -hmm. vision, and Pilot, P I L A T E is a betrayal mm -hmm. of, or a death. So that made me think of Toni Morrison. And so again, if you can link the dark feminine and, and transformation uh, to a kind of death. To dying, thank Bye. you, yeah. Phew, I'm glad I had coffee tonight, you guys. Okay, so, <laughs> um, yeah, all right. Let me, let me offer this for us, um, that, in order to connect with the dark feminine for women and perhaps even more so for men, there is a necessary dying in order to be able to do that. You, you, cannot, you cannot connect to the dark feminine with that. There is a sacrifice that is asked for, that is mandated. Often it's a sacrifice of ego. Often it's a sacrifice of egoic control. Often it's a sacrifice of, uh, you know, dying to the delusion that I, that I am in control, that I'm large and in charge. Um, and it's, it's giving this dark feminine. How, and I will say this, if we're able to make that sacrifice, almost always, if we're able to allow the dark feminine into the room, and I'm speaking dark feminine in the sense of a transformative feminine, right? We, we do not stay the same after an encounter with this. Um, I know I'm saying transformation takes a long time, but man, when the dark feminine shows up, if we're able to make the necessary sacrifice, and that's a very individual, that's a very individual scenario. Mm -hmm. You know, each of us, each of us will, will be asked that, um, you know, that we see this in literature, one of our faculty uh, and a dear friend and wonderful colleague, Sandy Salzilla, did an incredible presentation on this talking about in the novel, Elizabeth, help me out, was it Jane Eyre? About the crazy woman in the attic in the, in the literary novel, right? Gr Jane Eyre, yeah. where, where she was kept locked in the attic, right? And, and, but Jane Eyre had the ability, she allowed her into a room. Not only did she allow her into a room, she listened to her. And she took her advice. She got out of the house. And that was what then you see the whole novel moves forward from that. There's a huge shift and a change. That's the kind of energy that the dark feminine brings into our lives. Um, but we have to, usually there involves a dying to something in order to allow her admittance. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my experience uh, is that it is that uh, tension between the egoic resistance of the death and the, and that, that impulse to die 
that eventually there can be a, a give to that. And once you decide to die, you can actively start killing yourself in a positive way. <laughs> At least I've, I've been through that uh, quite a lot and quite lately. Um, and that's where there starts to be a real gap in my experience between the hero and the ego as an archetype, you know? Um, but anyway, that, I, I won't say much more about that, but I really appreciate, you know, what you're saying, you know, that, that every inch of growth uh, is, is through death. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's more like something you've built uh, that is not on stable ground. Before we go uh, to the audience, I want to check with Zaman. Zaman, do you have any thoughts or, or questions for us? Uh, I didn't have any until you just asked. <laughs> um, well, I was uh, thinking more in the, in the kind of cross-cultural, cross-tradition uh, linguistic terms that if the word beyond is showing the limit of the perception of a reality that we have all experienced, then what is, what is beyond it? And of course, at least at the age of it, uh, based on the wonderful presentation we had, uh, there are the dragons. The dragons uh, are serpents. The serpents are symbolically uh, the sign of um, reason. Uh, reason is which gives us a sense of comfort. Uh, we constantly change our reasoned perception into faith uh, when we feel comfortable with it, but then we have to go beyond that. And um, the way to connect with, with, the, with the beyond would be like, I mean, what comes to us or where do we go uh, to the other side? Uh, and uh, the three angels fit right right there because uh, I think uh, in, in Greek, uh, the angel means the messenger. Uh, in ancient uh, Persian, the word is feresta, uh, for those who uh, in the audience who might be interested, which has changed to feresta now, but feresta is like ferestenda, uh, which is also the name of the, the most significant angel in the Islamic tradition, which is uh, Jibril, which is Gabriel. Mm -hmm. But uh, Gabriel or Jibril comes from another Arabic, Arabic word, which I'm sure is familiar to most of you, uh, from the word uh, Jabr. Excuse me, let me turn off this phone. The messenger. <laughs> Um, yeah, when you get the messengers, you know it, <laughs> that's how it comes. So, uh, Jibril comes from the word Jabr. Jabr is like an algebra. Algebra means to break, like broken numbers. So, Jibril means that angel which breaks the realm between the human and the divine, where the human has no ability to reach to the beyond, and so it's the divine that reaches to humanity and breaks through that barrier. And through that barrier comes another message here. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. And so, um, so we go from, from uh, uh, I, let, let. Um, I usually get two or three calls in 24 hours, and they just happen to happen right now, this moment. Uh, sorry. Um, so, um, so we're talking about, you know, the beyond that there has to be an angel. And the three angels that um, uh, Laura Lee showed, they were, uh, they were beautiful. And again, uh, connected with the, uh, um, the handless uh, maiden. Uh, and if I remember correctly, in this uh, image, there were three angels with only three hands. The one in the middle had two, the one on the right had one, and the one on the left had none. Um, so you have to reach, even if you think you do not have the hand to reach to the beyond. And uh, uh, thinking of, again, another word that, that kind of uh, ties into this would be that of... Uh, reason and uh, the angel Gabriel or Gabriel uh, also means reason. Uh, the prophet went to heaven uh, 
with this angel, with the reason, and at a point the reason could not go any further and told the prophet, you have the heart, you go, I'm the reason, I can make it only thus far and no further. And so if you connect that with the Arabic word for aql or aqala, which means reason, that is the same word that they use for the head or for the crown or for the corona. So the corona, that's where the reasoning takes place. And if we're with this coronavirus, I think it is directing us back to our power of reason, to our sense of reason, to connect with the beyond and reach to a reality uh, at, at a higher level than that which we have been experiencing so much because we humans kind of got a little bit, not a little bit, probably very arrogant in the sense that, well, so long as we can reason things, we can define our reality. And therefore, through the over-reasoning of reality, the divine became irrelevant, totally irrelevant, uh, because we had conquered nature, and in a sense, we had conquered God too. And so, um, so that, was, that was gone. So I think this is, um, in my opinion, an, an awakening, um, uh, both th through reason and also to respond to that angel, to that messenger, to reach to the other side, to the beyond. And um, I hope, as Laura Lee referred to it, that if in a year or six months, I don't know however long it would take, when we get to that point, I hope we are prepared. We, I hope we are prepared to um, not only get the message that was sent our way, but to have a response to that message to send it back. But that, uh, that message would have to be uh, a, a, a very meaningful uh, uh, message in a way that can show our human, human vulnerabilities so that we are not really the center of everything and we do not necessarily have the absolute power and we have not conquered everything and that the world is more a divine-centered reality than a human-centered reality. Well, I'm sorry that if uh, this was with all these interruptions, if I made any sense, uh, but uh, forgive me for the, the interruption. What you're saying actually reminds me, and I was thinking about it, of Rumi's guest house, that these creatures, whatever it is that is beyond, is like the wound that wants to speak. It's the light that comes in through the bell. And I'm just touched by the number of metaphors that are very active and, and, and really percolating during this time of the coronavirus. What I might suggest now is that we as the panelists be receptive to the people in the audience and let's go and see if we have some questions out there. I see Diana and I'm gonna to try to figure out, okay, let's try that. Good. Diana? Hi, can you hear me? I can. Um, good night. I would like to make a question um, related to what Laura Lee mentioned at the end of her presentation about connecting with love and compassion. And uh, yeah, I, I would like to know like in the midst of of this, when we go to these very, very, very uh, dark and scary places of ourselves and when we are feeling all this pain and fear and confusion, how is that this connection to love and compassion can happen? Thank you for your question, Diana. It's a, it's a very difficult question because I think it's a very personal one. And, and I would say, say this, I think, you know, in the story of the, the handless maiden, you see two characters appear. You see a devil and you see an angel. And that's something you see in, in a lot of fairy tales. 
Um, and when you see that, you know, one of the ways to understand that is that 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 story has now moved into those waters where you are beyond the shore of reason and you are in that place where there needs to be a connection to something that supersedes reason and our ability to figure it out. There is a sense of the sacred and the ineffable. How each of us cultivates that is, is entirely up to, to us. But I think there is a necessity uh, in these waters in particular for some type of whatever word you wanna to give to it, sacred practice, spiritual practice, and however that manifests for you, it's not something that can be proscribed, but to find a, a, a way to connect to something that feeds and nourishes and can speak to you in that, in that darkness, in that dark place. Um, you know, I, I mean, I know, I know for me, I have my own practice, you know, that when I go to the, when I go to the depths, um, where I've experienced that and, and there's something greater that meets me there. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And also, I also would say this to you, I mean, in relation to that on a, maybe a little bit more practical level, it's really important. Sometimes we need, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a story that I heard about a little girl who was afraid of the dark and she it was bedtime. And she kept saying, she kept calling out to her mother who was downstairs, mommy, you know, I'm scared, I'm scared. And her mommy had gone up there and up and down, up and down the stairs and was getting really tired of doing that. And finally, the mom said to her, sweetie, just pray, Jesus is with you, just pray. And the little girl responded, yeah, but right now I need somebody with skin on. <laughs> <laughs> and so the other piece to that that I would say to you is, is it's really important. It doesn't have to be a lot of people, but you need some people with skin on who can be there when you hit those deep, dark places, right? That if you need to make that phone call at whatever time or you need to, that is, that it's, that's vital. That's critical. Thank it you. does seem to me that we are learning a new world order and we are already seeing it where restaurants and stores are being compelled to downsize their businesses, to ask people to socialize at a distance. And we are caught in that zone between congestion and emptiness. And it just seems to me that we are having to learn the middle path whatever that is, and it does take on physical proportions as we step out into the world and realize, you know, we do want to get this thing going again, but not at the expense of driving humanity out of existence. Is there anybody else in the audience that wants to interject or say something or ask a question or is there anybody else on the panel that has something, Zaman? Would you like to say something else again? Um, I'm afraid if I speak, my phone will ring again. <laughs> it probably will, but it's maybe it's better a phone than a cat. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I think I, I, you know, what I needed to say, I, I already did, is that the, um, the, the emphasis that we have been. Uh, having since the age of quote unquote enlightenment uh, has been kind of the marginalization of the, the beyond, uh, the divine, um, the, the realm that um, uh, did not fit within uh, the, the confines of reason. Uh, and we thought that was, that was the whole thing. Uh, and I think this is a, a wake up call uh, and, and a serious one at that. Um, and uh, yes, we are going to a new world order, but uh, I, I hope that uh, it is new in the sense of not just readjusted reality that we uh, had before, but in terms of a, a totally redefined one, uh, in terms of these values. Um, I, I, I think the the soul needed uh, some tending. Uh, a lot of the things uh, that had become so irrelevant that the world 
was basically living on such an artificiality that that we needed to uh, reconnect mm -hmm. uh, to realign uh, and and I, I think in that sense part of the reasons would have been uh, organized religion uh, which took such a monopoly of uh, of the concept of God and the concept of divinity and all that, that uh, anytime you mention anything similar, uh, people would just dismiss you because it appeared like you were talking about religion. And I don't think it is mm -hmm. uh, solely the domain of religion, especially, especially the organized religion. And I think in that sense, we need to uh, uh, disorganize a little bit. I don't know if I'm coining a word there. Uh, and to open this up that um, there's a lot to be known and it does not have to be known and understood and defined within the compartmentalized learning systems that, that we have. Thank you, Zaman. I think last week I said something like, let's let it fall apart. You know, as this thing is coming apart, there's something useful to not putting it back together quite so quickly that it that it becomes a, a newly informed structure on its own. Uh, I see Dolores. So, so yes. real quick, uh, Dana, before yeah. we go, I, I just wanted to comment on that because I think that Laura Lee said something about this so important earlier. You know, I think it's so easy to be like, is this the moment that we let it fall apart? But Laura Lee was talking about postmodernism. Mm -hmm. And I think what's so important to realize is that since World War II, we have been actively taking it the heck apart. We have been deconstructing any systems that are there. Beauty is a bad word. God is a bad word. All that kind of stuff. And I, and I, you know, I, I believe that you know, maybe we're in a final death, but I don't think the death just started. I think that we, my, my hope, and this is where I'm going to get a little personal, my hope is that the B word starts coming back. You know, my, my hope is that, um, you know, we start reconstructing again. And Laura Lee, how do you, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot for that. But no, no, no. I think you're, you're, you're right on it, Will. Um, I, I'm right there with you on this. I think in the arts, we are, in fact, seeing it come back. And we have been for quite a yeah. few years. You're seeing it in the, you're seeing it in the ballet world. You're seeing it in the, in the uh, art world. Uh, me. Yeah, meaning, meaning and beauty and soul there, you know, because it, look, this is always a pendulum, right? The pendulum swings, you know, from here to here. So we're, we're back on that, that swing. I think where the, where the differentiation is needed is yes, we're recognizing, I think there is a, whether it's, whether it's verbalized or not, there is a recognition that we do not exist without meaning. We do not exist without soul. We do not exist without beauty. Even Rick Tarnas will say, he talks about there seems to be something in the cosmos that, that is, um, and I'm not, this isn't an exact quote, but he said there is something in the cosmos that is uh, conditioned for beauty that serves no evolutionary purpose right it doesn't serve a practical purpose so so our souls our souls crave beauty however that's defined our souls crave meaning our souls our psyches will connect to and will create gods whether we say we believe in them or not they they're going to be i think the bigger question is i don't think we're walking into a new world order I don't, it's not going to be that easy or that fast mm -hmm. um not yet i think we're moving in that direction and i think I think the artist, just like, you know, often in all these ancient civilizations, before the armies ever marched into a territory to disrupt, destroy, whatever, they were preceded by artists. They were pre we put musicians in front of armies. We put musicians and dancers in front of armies and military. I mean, it, it, it's, it's an incredible metaphor of the artists are usually the ones out in front of massive upheaval and change, right? And so I think you're you're exactly right. I think you're you know that that you're on it is is yeah. This is this has got to happen first. And what you're saying that it might not be like sunrise moment to a new day. Just changing directions at midnight is a pretty freaking big change. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think how, you know how individual is it? How do I change? You know that's the question I'm sitting with. When you know when we all come out of lockdown. 
what is the, what's the transformation? What's the difference that I'm walking out my front door with, mm. you know? Yeah. Instead of walking through TJ Maxx, I'm going through, I'm going into the woods. I'm going into, I've spent, I've spent lockdown walking into the deep, dark woods, you know, toward a deep wood. And I'm going to continue that. Right. So, so what will change? And I think the other piece to that is there's still so much that has not been deconstructed. And I, I don't want to step on any toes and I don't want to go there because it, it can get, people can start going into archetypal seizures. But I, I don't think we're, I don't think we're there yet relative to the deconstruction of the systemic injustices and woundings of a patriarchal culture for men and for women. We're not there. We're nowhere near there. Until, until I start seeing more men showing up to come alongside of women relative to violence against women, until I start seeing, you know, then that will tell me that tide is starting to turn. Um, but we're, we're, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. You know, and hopefully the artists, the creatives can help lead the way in that. I agree. This is part of what... Um opening up too quickly as a form of desperation yes um exercises a deep creativity that um annihilates uh, that can destroy and that can break things down further which paradoxically has a positive and a negative side and for me the covid virus is an accelerant to what has been going on. I'm echoing a little bit of what's just been said. And so it's a, it's for me, approach avoidance. It's, it's both. And uh, that's the tension, Laura Lee, that you uh, have come back to again and again tonight, <clears throat> which I think is probably the most powerful archetypal <clears throat> situation uh, that Jung would call it, uh, that exists right now. And so I've never felt, I mean, I'm in my mid seventies. I've never felt so transitional in life as right now. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm sure. trying to learn to not be comfortable with it, but <clears throat> um, learn from it. Yeah. So, to learn from yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, Dennis, you're, you're right. And I think we're in between this regressive pullback that von Franz writes about. She said, whenever there's a forward movement to, to in the collective, you're going to immediately see a regressive pullback, right? We can see this politically. And we're also asked to hold our own what, what is she called a regression, a, a healing regression. The healing, so I know she's talking about regression being healing, meaning those times where you're going into the deep dark woods to heal what we see illustrated in the story of the handless maiden, right? So while in the collective, there's a regressive pullback that is not necessarily generative or may not be what we, what we like, we're also giving ourselves permission and, and holding the necessity for allowing ourselves the generosity of having a healing regression where we retreat into the deep dark woods, where we go back to nature, where we're going down to the depths. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, too, uh, a couple of tropes have been brought up about postmodernism and both. Um, and it doesn't have to be either or. It can be both and. Mm -hmm. as, as somebody said, that's where Dante's uh, poem begins. Yes. Thank you. Very well. Exactly. Thank you. And this is what I like about what you said, Laura Lee, in terms of the artist, um, mm -hmm. because the artist does both and. So, for example, mm -hmm. you talked about uh, the artist and the search for meaning, which I agree with. On the other hand, you have an artist, and I want you to respond to this, uh, like the choreographer, uh, Merce Cunningham, mm -hmm. who, when they asked him the meaning of his dances, he says, I don't do meaning, right? I, this is an embodied response. I leave interpretation to other people. This is an embodied mm -hmm. So could you kind of talk about that in relationship to art? How art can do both? Yeah, it can do both. I mean, you know, Merce is not one of my favorite choreographers, but he was a talented, brilliant choreographer. But yeah, that was his philosophy. That was his approach was, I just want to create a blank canvas. You as 
spectator, you as audience can project or take whatever meaning you want, you know, out of this. Um, in a sense, there's, he holds his own meaning even in that, right? He's, he's, a, he's, he's ascribing to a certain meaning even in that philosophy. I'm not, I'm not going to proscribe the meaning for you, but I'm going to offer you the opportunity to have this alchemical mix that you get when an audience is, because, you know, people, that was another conversation we used to have often, you know, that, that, you know, performative dance is non-participatory. <laughs> the audience participates in a theater. I mean, you may be sitting in a seat, but you ask any, any dancer, any perf anybody who's in, been a performer, you know, the audience is participating with you uh, mm -hmm. in that. Um, so I, yeah, I think that there's, there's meaning even in his insistence that I'm not, he, all, what he's saying is I'm not going to give you the meaning, mm -hmm. but I'm going to hold the space and create the opportunity for you to do that. Right. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a beauty of art. How can we create opportunities for people and hold the space? In that sense, you know, therapy is art. Mm -hmm. You're holding the space. Mm -hmm. You're creating the opportunity and you're holding the space and you're holding the tension and you're coming alongside the client that you're working with. You're not painting the picture for them. You're not giving the meaning for them, but you're holding that space and creating that opportunity. Can we go to the audience and um, let's let one of the unseen voices from beyond. Uh, Dolores, I think I have you un unmuted now. Yes. Hi there. Thank you so much. Um, yes, Laura Lee, you said something a while ago about when the dark feminine uh, comes and calls, you, you really you have to pay attention. And um, I think in this collective journey of, that this COVID thing is forcing us into, that it's each an individual journey that we're each Persephone being yanked into the underworld. And um, the metaphor with dance, I, I had a lot of dance training as a younger woman, but right now I'm doing a lot of yoga. And the experience is not only the seven chakras, but the two above the head, eight and nine, that go four to six feet above, and then 10th chakra, which is two to four feet below. Um, until you're really grounded in the energy beneath your feet, there's no way that the energy can rise and that you could ever possibly shoot through the crown chakra into uh, a more expanded reality. So what Dennis was talking about uh, coming up too soon, um, we're limiting ourselves in terms of where we can go as a whole civilization if we don't take the opportunity to really mm -hmm. answer the call to just be in the dark and overcome our fears and get the gifts of the dark. Like Persephone became the queen of the underworld. She wasn't a victim, you know? And I don't think we're victims here. I think there's such a great opportunity for each of us to really get rooted and grounded in something that's unfamiliar and sometimes scary. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dolores. Yeah, yeah, your point is exactly that rooting, that rootedness is critical. Jung talked about rooting into the ground, right? Going into the, going into the depths, it's critical. Stanley, do we have another guest out there? Nope. Oh, sorry. I might I might have blocked what you were saying. Uh, do we have another guest? Uh, Four one zero number. Oh, I don't see a hand raised on it though. You brought somebody in. Okay. There's no hand. Can can do you have been a handless uh, audience? <laughs> handless maiden. <laughs> okay. Um. I, I will say, I want to say something addressing about the amount of time. Those who are willing to undergo this rite of initiation to whatever the future holds for us are going to, in a way, become a kind of a tribe because we are willing to endure whatever it is. Those who are unwilling to do it and who are demonstrating now about um, social distancing, we want to get back out there, and they were going to do this too quickly. 
there's going to be a gap between these two populations of people. And that's what does trouble me. Because in a way, some of those are in our families. You know, we have brothers and sisters and uncles and cousins and friends down the street who don't share the whole idea of diving deeply into this so that we come out with a renewed transformed consciousness. However we come out of this, these things that we're talking about, at least from what I understand in the medical community, are going to be around us for a while, at least a year. You know, the whole notion of just being able to go back out and, you know, play full court basketball and go to movies and concerts and dances and all that kind of thing, it's not going to happen within the next six months. And that it troubles me that there's a huge part of the population that is making that a central part of what our culture is about to become. I agree. I agree. I mean, and we're all in it together. Whether they, whether there are differences of opinion, we're all in it. And these, again, these are family members and friends, and we have to figure out ways to coexist. And in, in a way, like Connie was talking, romancing the shadow. I mean, we have to get to know what we don't really want to get to know with it, the impatience that they feel, the, the difference of opinions. We, we do have to coexist. We have to figure out a way that this makes sense for everybody. You know, I, I would I would chime in just to also say, uh, you know, lest we alienate that that other tribe, yeah. you know, just to say that um, a lot of it is maybe resistant ego, sure, but a lot of it's also survival instinct. I don't have time to go into myself. I gotta, you know, take care of the the meal, you know, and and a lot of it also is, is Atlas archetype. I can't let this thing fall. Mm -hmm. It's my responsibility to make sure it doesn't. And so I, I, you know, I will say, I think that we are going, ultimately, we're not gonna get through without some kind of dialogue between mm -hmm. these impulses. We need the survival instinct too. You know, we, we need the don't let the freaking planet fall too. Uh, you know, and, and I think it's up to us, it's up to all of us to use compassion and love and wisdom to create a dialogue to try and you know bring those into concert uh, so that we can get through this together. Agreed. Should we go for one more question? You know, I think we're we're so almost out of time. I, I think that we should, uh, and I know Laura Lee, I wanna make sure she has a chance for any closing thoughts. And I know that Elizabeth has a, a nice quote for us. Uh, you know, Why maybe, don't we do that? Let's and do that. You know, Elizabeth, if you wanna come in and then we'll, have final thoughts and then uh, I'll stay out of it and you can, you can do our ritual, Dana. Right. Okay. Um, thank you again, Laura Lee, for such a wonderful presentation. I found a quote uh, from Marion Woodman, um, uh, an essay from 1987. So this goes to your point, Dennis, about COVID-19 being an accelerant for something that's been in process for a while. So this isn't a question, it's just um, a final thought that I think captures some of what you're you're doing with the Sophia Center. Um, Woodman says, perched on the threshold of a new feminine consciousness, we are terrified to let the old values die because we are afraid to move into the unknown. Many of us are caught in a liminal state between what is dead and what is not yet born. We find ourselves in a most dangerous period of transformation because we can no longer respect ourselves as we were, yet we have very little idea of who we may become. Mm. Beautiful. 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 And so, and so we join together at that still point, right? At that still point where we're not yet who we're going to be, we're not in the beyond, and we, we're not who we were, and we hold the tension rather than rushing prematurely to fill that space. We hold the tension and we stand, I believe, together in solidarity at the still point because that's where the dance is. That's the dance. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful.
Thank you so much. I want to want to just close with one of the lines from the poem that I just read because it hearkens to what it is that we're saying now. And the line is, the attempt to be invulnerable is the vain attempt to become something we are not, and most especially to close off our understanding of the grief of others. So with that as sort of a parting shot across the bow, I just, I think it's been a beautiful time, Laura Lee. I thank you so much for traveling all this distance from North Carolina, you know? <laughs> There's two North Carolinians that I've spoken with today. And, and I love that. Um, bear with me one more time. One more moment of silence, please. Will, I thank you once again for sharing in these endeavors with me. They're, they're beautiful. Uh, these community gatherings, what we have going, the panel that we've been able to assemble, uh, it's just wonderful. And so with that, we'll be in touch soon. I love you all. Thank you, everyone. Beautiful. Thank you, Laura Lee. Thank you all so much. Good night. Thank you. Great night. Thank you very much. All right. Good night.